As we look at this fairly simple question on chemical bonding, it relates to the naming and getting the formulas of various compounds. Let's read the question carefully. It says, write down the chemical formula for each of the following compounds, which we have over here. So the first compound we're looking at is aluminium sulfide. So aluminium sulfide. It's important in our minds to get what type of compound this is. Aluminium we know to be a metal and sulfur to be a non-metal. Now the sulfide, the IDE, tells us that there's no oxygen involved in this particular compound. So we are now are going to set about getting the formula for it. We start off writing the formula for aluminium, Al, and then the formula for sulfur. And that's a key thing that we know this is sulfur, not any sulfate or sulfite. This is a sulfide. And that's the first step. Write down those two symbols next to one, each other, one another. Now the next symbol is to write down the charges. Aluminium, we know, occurs in group 3 and acquires a charge of plus 3 as an ion. Sulfur, on the other hand, is in group 6 and acquires a charge of minus 2. So now our whole compound has to have zero charge in total. So there are two ways to go about this. We could realize that in order to achieve a total charge of zero, we're going to need two aluminiums, each with a charge of plus three. So we could write that down, something like two times by minus three, plus how many sulfurs would we need in order to neutralize that total charge over there. And we'd see we'd need three sulfurs, and that would give us a total charge of zero. However, there's a shorter way to do it. We could take the positive value from the metal and write it there with the non-metal, take the negative value from the non-metal and write it there. Sort of crossing over these numbers, but remember not to include the signs. And they would produce the exact same result in the end. So our final answer then would be that uh, would be aluminium that's the metal first always the positive ion and there's the sulfur and now we write down just the numbers it would be Al2 and S3 so that's the formula for aluminium sulfide let us look now at the next one. Copper 2 chloride. Watching carefully, the copper is the metal and it gets a, a, a charge of plus 2 as indicated by the Roman numerals over there. Chloride, IDE over here, indicates that it's simply the chlorine. There's no oxygens attached to it. So let's follow those same steps. We'd start off by writing down the symbols. Cu for copper, always the first letter being a capital. Chloride, Cl, once again the first letter being a capital. Now we're going to move to the charges that they acquire. The copper acquires a charge of 2 plus, and the chlorine acquires a charge of minus, 1 minus. That's because chlorine is in group 7. Now we go to the crossover step stage. The crossover stage the metal gets the, neg the, the charge of uh, the number 1 from the non-metal, and the non-metal gets the number 2 from the metal. So this produces our, our final answer. Here we have the copper and the chlorine, and by crossing those numbers over, we now get 1 for the copper, which we don't write. It's implied and then two for the chlorines like that. And that would be the formula for that compound. Right, the final compound here is iron 3 phosphate. So let's have a look at this one. Following the exact same steps as we did before, iron is Fe and phosphate. Phosphate is one of those ones you need to learn off by heart from your table. 
It's what we call a polyatomic ion or a composite ion. So the phosphate, the central atom in that is the phosphorus, P, O. Anything with ATE behind it tells you that it's got some oxygen in it. And in this case, you'd need to remember that's uh, PO4. And now we move on to the charges they acquire as ions. Iron, they tell us, is, uh, uh, gains a charge of 3 plus. That is, once again, by the Roman numerals in the bracket behind it. And phosphate, phosphate, one of the things you need to learn with the name of the iron, how to spell the, the name, uh, what the formula is, you would also need to learn off by heart that it requires a charge of minus 3. So we're now going to go to the crossover stage. The crossover stage would be that the 3 from the phosphate would go to the iron, and the 3 from the iron would go to the phosphate. But in this case, we're crossing over numbers which are equal. So in the end, the ratios between these ions, when the compound is formed, is a ratio of 1 is to 1. So our final answer then would be iron Fe PO4 for the phosphate, iron phosphate. Name the following compounds. Now we're going from the formula to the name, and this is equally impo as important. As we look at the first one, we're going to be reading the formula NH4NO3. Now there's quite a lot of memory work involved in chemistry. And if you know that memory work, then you can start doing the calculations and the deductions. When we look at this, we see that we have ammonium, the ammonium ion. And from your table, you could refer to, or you should know by now, has a charge of plus one. And then the nitrate over there is the negative ion. We always mention the cation or the positive ion first, followed by the negative ion or the anion. So we could write the name for this. Ammonium That's the cation, followed by the anion here, nitrate. And there we have the name of the first compound. Let's look at the second compound now. The second compound is made up of the metal lithium, and it is combined with the composite ion of sulfate. Let's have a look at the, the way we would write this. To start off with, we write lithium for the metal, which forms the positive ion. Now lithium, because it's in group 1, always acquires a charge of plus 1. So there's no need to write its charge or oxidation state in brackets behind it. And then sulfate, SO4, is one of the ones you would know from your table that you have to learn. And so the name of that compound is now lithium sulfate. Now let's have a look at this last um, example over here. When we look at this last example, we see that we have got sulfur combined with three oxygen atoms. We need to have a look at what type of compound this, be, this would be. We have a non-metal bonded with a non-metal. So over here we don't have an ionic compound, so it's not a matter of positive and negative charges. Uh, charged particles attracting each other. We've got covalent bonds, we've got a sharing of electrons, but let's look at the name. Over here, the, it's, it's actually quite simple. The, the sulfur, we write like that, and then it's followed by, or it's connected to three oxygens. Okay, and we get that from the number three over there. So, sulfur, tri, which represents the three oxide. Sulfur trioxide. That would be the name of the third compound. We now move on to the next question here, 3.3. 3. It says methane has the following molecular structure. 
Methane is the name of a compound you should know. It's one of the, the ones you need to learn off by heart. And they tell us now it has the following molecular structure. So we see that there's a carbon in the middle and it is connected to four hydrogens like that. Now the first question regarding is what kind of a bond exists between the carbon and the hydrogen atom? So we're talking about this line over here. This line represents that bond and it's the same bond occurring four times over. So over here, we need to look at carbon, whether it's a metal or a non-metal. And from the periodic table, you know that would be a non-metal. Hydrogen's also non-metal. So we have a non-metal bonded onto a non-metal. So to put this in writing, we would say that the carbon-hydrogen bond is a non-metal bonded to a non-metal. This tells us that is a covalent bond. And now we need to look at the type of covalent bond because there are various types according to the electronegativity. Covalent bonds are all about the sharing of electrons. There's a pair of electrons which, um, which comprise the, that bond and the one comes from the, the carbon atom and the other one comes from the hydrogen atom. So the one comes from the carbon, let's call that the X, and the other one comes from the hydrogen. But where do they sit? Do they uh, spend more of their time with the carbon or more of their time with the hydrogen? A careful look at the table of electronegativity shows that the electrons actually spend more time with the carbon. So this would tell us that the bonding pair spends more time with the carbon like that, and but not uh, too much, it's, it's just slightly polar. So then we would call this a, a slightly polar covalent bond, or weakly polar. Okay, the next question reads, is methane a polar or a non-polar molecule? Explain. Now, when we look at the whole molecule, as I will highlight now, when we look at the whole molecule, we need to consider the polarity of every bond. So what we've seen is so far is that it is a, a we have a weakly covalent, a weakly polar covalent bond, and that the carbon is pulling the electrons with a greater pull than the hydrogen is pulling the electrons. So if we were to write this now um, for each of these bonds, the, the hydrogen side is all slightly positive. We call that delta plus, delta plus, delta plus, and delta plus, because each of these bonds is slightly polar. The carbon in the middle is pulling on those electrons with a greater pull. So the carbon in the middle is, is more negative. But now the question is, is the whole molecule polar? Let me just read it, polar or non-polar? Now, for a molecule to be polar, it needs to have one side which is positive and one side which is negative. If we look at this molecule, there's no negative side to this molecule. It's equally positive on all sides. So hence, we have a non-polar molecule. The reason for that is it does not have a dipole. It does not have two opposite charges at either end. 